Welcome, guys. So today I have a guest. I'm interviewing someone who's the author of a book that I came across in my research on patriarchy. And you know how I've really um, dived into the responsibility of fatherhood and it's sorely lacking in this world and that a return to patriarchy might be a good idea. And so I found the book on Amazon called The Case for Patriarchy, bought it right away, devoured it and loved it. And it so turned out that uh, the author of the book and myself have some friends in common that linked us together. And so I'm really proud to introduce and welcome Timothy Gordon to our conversation about patriarchy here today. Uh, real briefly, before we get into our conversation, I just want to introduce Timothy. Uh, he is uh, JD, P-H-L-M-A, right? A bunch of important letters next to his name. So you know he's a smart dude. Once you read the book, you'll know why. Uh, he studied the philosophy of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas in pontifical graduate universities in Rome, taught at the Southern Californian colleges, and then went on to law school. He holds a degree in literature, history, philosophy, and law. He resides in Southern Mississippi with his large family, writing, teaching, and speaking on philosophy and theology. For leisure, he wears the fur of endangered species, eats preservative-rich and plastic-wrapped foods, and admittedly refuses to recycle. <laughs> in, the, uh, in these dark days uh, of the church and the world, he lives by the maxim of G.K. Uh, G. Chesterton, Solemnity follow, flows out of men naturally, but laughter is a leap. It is easy to be heavy, hard to be light. That's beautiful, dude. Well, Timothy, thank you for joining us, bro. Oh, it's such an honor to be here with you, Elliot. Thanks for reading that ridiculous bio. Of mine. <laughs> and uh, man, long live the patriarchy. I, I'm excited to get into this with you. That's right, dude. And so you're a patriarch yourself. You've got more kids than me, and I've got quite a few. Can you tell us how many children you have? I've got six kids now, five girls and one boy, and I've got a little girl on the way. Wow, that's amazing. Fun. And you're a young dude too, right? You're about 40? Yeah, I'm 40. I'm 40 right on the button. So we're, we're, we're similar ages. It, it's hilarious that I would get uh, six little girls and one little boy. It's actually an amazing thing that this patriarch managed to put one stem on one apple. But, but the little girls are a joy in a totally different way from the boy. Uh, um, and and uh, hopefully we can talk about some of the natural sex differences today. They are plenary. Yeah, I've got three daughters myself. And as we get into this conversation, maybe we'll dive into what it's important for us as fathers to share and emulate uh, for our daughters and for our sons to uh, really patch up some of the mess that we've found ourselves in over the past 100 years or so. Uh, to begin, why don't I just ask a, a really basic question? Uh, you're making a case for patriarchy. What does patriarchy mean and why does it need a case? Excellent question, Elliot. It is simply Western civilization, which more simply is built upon Christianity. Christianity, i.e. Western civilization, is the patriarchy. Now in Christianity, as you all know, my friend, it's a bifurcated patriarchy. There's an upper clerical level that people like me, if you check me out on, on YouTube, Timothy Gordon, or go to timothyjgordon.com, I spend a lot of time talking about the problems with the upper clerical patriarchy, you know, the all male presbyterate and episcopate of, of priests and bishops uh, established directly by Christ. But I lately I've been talking a lot more about the culture, which is to say the lower patriarchy comprised of Christian laymen, Christian householders like you and me, who have been completely cucked over the last 150 years. Feminism began in the year 1848. And the patriarchy was the big game in the crosshairs of the first wave feminists. Lots of, you know, halfway conservatives, cocked conservatives and, and Christians, Ned Flanders, wimpy style Christians talk about feminism as if it began in 1970. 
and, and they'll they'll say, you know, there are some good forms of of ad form. Second wave feminism began in 1970. Utterly, utterly untrue, which I prove in this book. There is no good form of feminism. First wave feminism actually, especially honestly, came of Christianity, which is to say the patriarchy. So when you hear a feminist or even someone that doesn't think they're a feminist since they're so brainwashed, say on TV or on the internet that the patriarchy is toxic. They're talking about Christianity, you know, the, the, the one true faith. And they're talking about the cultural elements of the family, wherein mothers took over the jobs of fathers and fathers have been relegated to the position of mothers. It's a kind of matriarchy, which the feminists have talked about a lot in the last 150 years. Why is it that you say Christianity simply cannot coexist with feminism? Good question. Because Christianity is explicitly set up as the, the faith of Jesus Christ, who established completely explicitly this, this all-male presbyterate and episcopate, the upper patriarchy, and if you look at the Bible, the readings of St. Paul, seven, seven or eight places, I list them all on this hilarious uh, and, and uh, really attractive, God saved the patriarchy cup, <laughs> going through the, the seven spots in St. Paul, where he, he makes it utterly, utterly clear, crystal clear, I might even say, it's not a crystal glass, that men are the heads of households. Women are to be submissive in all things to their husbands. And that's not just Ephesians 5, which the Roman Catholic Church is now bracketing in the Missal. They say, you don't have to read this. That's also 1 Peter, it's 1 Corinthians, it's Timothy, it's Titus. It's all over the place in the New Testament and, of course, in the Old Testament. That makes it utterly clear that in the lower patriarchy, the household, men are, men are the, in the image and glory of God. Women are the glory of man. Men are the glory of God. Women are the glory of man. It comes directly out of Holy Scripture. And aside from that, I mean, we could talk about all the scriptural passages, Elliot, but what a lot of these wimpy Christians who are getting a little less wimpy make the mistake of doing is talking only explicitly about revelation and supernatural law. It's also in natural law. It is so crystal clear that even this, the WNBA players whine about the fact that they're underpaid. They're actually overpaid. They would be nothing if not for the NBA. They've been around 26 years and they've never once been in the black. They are a, a leech upon the NBA. Then in other sports, the natural law dictates everyone, even the feminists, know that men and women are different physically. Men and women are different fundamentally in their brain chemistry. And they're not, they're not wanting men to be involved in all of these female undercard fights that I see every time on UFC. There's no clamor. There's no popular outcry for men to be fighting women, are there? And of course, the transgender lobby gets involved in the mix in a funny way because men are fighting women in the, force, uh, in the form of some transgenders. But my point in pointing this out is simply that the natural law speaks the same truth as clearly and as loudly as the supernatural law does, in, particularly in the New Testament writings of St. Paul. What do you say to people who argue that feminism is about equality and that for, for, for a long time, uh, the patriarchy reigned and that it's now time to dissolve it and usher in a new sort of, I don't know, feminine utopia? Well, I say in one aspect, they're right. It is a strain of egalitarianism. It, it, the, the push for equality. Men and women are not equal, except in dignity before God, or we're both made in the image and likeness of God. Men are better than women at being men, and women are better than men at being women. And the jobs, the roles, the ergonomics, the, the functionalism is utterly, utterly different. I want to point out two things, okay? First, Elliot, is the fact that... Um, Feminism took about 100, that is 10 to the power of two, 100 years to, I don't know, marinade. 
right? It started in 1848 at something called the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York. And their, their demands there, the feminist dames, were completely recognizable to what you'd call toxic second or third wave feminism. So it's a lie to say that there's any kind of appreciable difference between first and second wave feminism. Totally toxic, totally anti-man, totally anti-Christian in 1848. Feminism really came out starting a couple decades before what we call second wave feminism, which is like 1970, all the women got shamed into the workplace. Um, so, so call it 1950 is really when it started coming out inquietly. So it took about 100 years. And feminism is the idea that a man can act like a woman, a woman can act like a man, particularly in the home place or the workplace. That took 100 years. Now, um, like the, the global homo lobby really kicked in in the early to mid 90s, and culminated in the early to mid 2000s with like Pro Proposition 8 in California. I, I used to live in California. Now I live in Mississippi. So it took about 10 years. Because look what happened from feminism. If, if the, you know, the feminists say a woman and a man can act the same ergonomically, then all the, the global homo lobby did is it said they, they can do so in the bedroom, right? You can swap out a man for a woman or a woman for a man. And that look how look at the time collapse, right? Look at the logarithmic growth curve, 10 to the power of two to base and to grow feminism, 10 to the power of one then much quicker to base and grow uh, uh, the global homo lobby. And then look what happened in 2015, 2016. It took all of one year for us to start hearing about Bruce Jenner, right? One year that the whole transsexual lobby came out and then all of a sudden everyone was talking about pronouns. It took no time to base at all. One year at all, that's 10 to the power of zero. Uh, math fiends out there. So we went from this, this, you know, lengthier basting time for feminism to homosexualism, which there's a connection between those ideologies. If a man can act like a woman, then he can act like a woman in the bedroom. That's global homo. And then from that, that 10 year basting period became a one year basting period when the, the LGBT movement said, well, if a man can act like a woman in the bedroom, then he could be a woman in the bedroom and elsewhere. To so see the ideological linkage and see the, the direction of travel and the increasing speed of travel, that's really important. Feminism underlies both of those so much that one sees feminism even in the creation story, Adam and Eve, the original sin, the source of all of our sickness, suffering, and death as human beings. There is one leftist subversive ideology that underlies all the others. You know, homosexualism, transgenderism, Marxism, all the variant forms of socialism. There's one that's the crown gem, the pinnacle of all of them. It's feminism. And we know because it's there right, right in Eden at the fall of, of Adam and Eve in Genesis's first couple chapters. A man acting like a woman, a woman acting like a man. John Chrysostom, a saint in both the East and the West tradition of the Christian church, says that... Um, if Adam would have dealt with the serpent, then he never would have been tricked. It's mat women's natural softness, her natural uh, trustfulness that causes women to fall. And this is not to bash women. Women are much better than men and much more beautiful than men when they do their natural roles. We're just different. So it's very fundamental stuff. So if I hear you correctly, you're associating feminism with... Marxism, communism, uh, transgenderism, LBTism. Uh, how do all these things fit together? And why, why is it that feminism is the, uh, the spark for this, this fire that we're, we're seeking to put out? Yeah, it's that it, it underlies all of the other uh, subversive ideological leftisms. That the ideological direction of travel it, it involves different accidents, of course, right? Socialism is economic in nature. It's a political economy. It's an effeminate one, but it's, it's a political economy. So it has a different substance. Of course, uh, transgenderism in many ways accidentally contradicts the, the best interest of the feminists, if you will. Um, pick any of the other, the other subversive leftisms over the last 200 years, 300 years since the French Revolution. They're not all identical. What I'm saying instead is that the, the sacred cow of the left, think of Saul Alinsky writing uh, 
Rules for Radicals, okay? He said at the beginning of that book in Rules for Radicals that he uh, committed his entire set of works to the initial, the primeval radical, Satan, who wanted a kingdom of his own, right? The original have-not, Satan. And um, so Alinsky and the leftists, which has become increasingly clear over the last five years, know that the font of their dark powers is Satan. What I'm saying is that um, the ideological direction of travel of the left all stems from feminism. I wrote this book called Rules for Retrogrades, 40 Rules to Counteract, Countermand, Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. And what we talk about is really feminism is the beating heart of leftism. The way you can tell, there are a few different tells for this, and you, you kind of have to read a case for patriarchy because it really makes the case that it's the central leftism. It's the central vice on which the left plays, getting men addicted to all kinds of bad things that um, enervate them, that weaken them, that make them weak. Okay, so that's that's really fundamental. The West, Western civilization and Christianity, those are three synonyms. They're all built on the idea that virtue is strength. Virtue is arete in Greek. It just means moral excellence. I got my shirt here with Plato and Aristotle playing basketball. And they believed in something called hylomorphism, especially Aristotle, meaning greatness in body, greatness in soul. You will be moral, smart, and fit when you are doing the right thing. He called it the function argument. When you're functioning as you are built to, you'll be firing on all cylinders. And there's a connection between them. It's not, Plato had this view that it's more like body and soul operate separately. Feminism attacks all of them at once, whereas the other subversive leftisms in the past 250 years tend to focus on one to attack political economy, right? Distribution of goods, uh, private contract, you know, the most fundamental that attacks all at once is feminism, which is why you see it there in the garden at Original Sin. It's the main reason that, uh, that human beings fell in the Christian tradition is because of this sin of gender bending, sex swapping, you know, which, which leads naturally to homosexualism and, and transgenderism. So it's, it's not that it's an act of uh, Marxism is necessarily an act of feminism. It's that the ideology of the attack on nature Men are built to be morally good, intellectually good, physically good, and, and so are women in a totally different way. And the attack on that, the confusion on that, wrought by ultimately the, the enemy, uh, the diabolic enemy, is uh, fundamental to all the other leftisms. Hmm. So I remember somewhere in your book, you assert in, in your own words uh, I didn't pull this quote out, that uh, in some way the sexual revolution and then the, the glorification of promiscuity is what allowed the feminists to usurp masculine power. In other words, uh, it's the men who fell for free sex or the sexual revolution that have al has allowed this to uh, sort of unfold. Things like the pill uh, and abortion and, you know, free love sort of... Um, Put, put, put modern man in Adam's place to ultimately end up following his wife. How is it, how is it that the sexual revolution allowed all this to unfold? That's a great question. First off, I would, I would preempt it by saying this. My wife is my best friend. Aristotle in both the ethics and the politics talks about, uh, he, he's, he's a base chad aristotle is and he's writing 300 years before christ the reason he's so important in the christian intellectual tradition aristotle is because he got almost everything right based on the natural law alone and what he said is um this, this kind of waspy notion about fathers fathers can't be friends with sons no fathers shouldn't always indulge their sons because that would be doing what is wrong for their sons it would be going against the uh, ultimate good of their sons but Aristotle says in these relationships of inequality between a father and a son, a teacher and his student, a man and his wife, where there's an inequality of power, he says it's, it's a bunch of bull roar that they are not friendships. These can be the closest forms of friendship, but they're called friendships between unequals. 
And so a man and a wife are in the, especially in the sacramental Christian tradition, best friends, but their best friendship is based on mutual need. The man needs a handmaiden, a best friend that he's to whom he's gentle, by the way, this all sounds kind of harsh. And, and some guys that, that uh, take it out of context, take it in the wrong direction. This is, this is a relationship of uh, it is utterly genteel. It is other, utterly gentle a properly functioning, a properly ordered man-woman friendship. Almost no arguing. Almost no arguing. He needs a helper. A woman needs a head. The head and the heart need each other, as St. Paul uh, beautifully writes in Scripture. So the idea is not just... It is macho. I'm not going to lie. It is a macho worldview that uh, true Christianity, along with Aristotle 300 years before, espouses. But it's not, it's not BS machismo. It is take care of women, protect women, and take care of your protectorship, men. Guard your guardianship. Don't give it up. Um, you have to be strong. Uh, another important figure out of the uh, rabbinical tradition is this, for, for Christians, it's apocryphal. We don't have it in Genesis. But this first wife of Adam that in the Talmud they teach was real. We teach it wasn't real. This figure of Lilith. Uh, Adam's first wife, who um, feminists, I, I cite this in the book, they, they like Eve because Eve defied God. She defied the patriarchal order that God set up. Adam was her head, her charge. And, um, but she got caught. She got in trouble. She had to suffer birth pains. The feminists like even more than Eve, Lilith, the demon wife, the first wife of Adam, who tricked him, who you, cucked him basically using sex. She ended up having sex with the serpent and she got away with it. So I have explicit early feminist sources saying they like Lil, they like Eve okay because she disobeyed. She upset the natural order of man, uh, of creation more than man because we're the pinnacle of creation. But, but Lilith was Adam's first wife who you, you remember, look, how, look at all the pop culture references. You're, you're my age, Elliot. Lilith Fest, Lilith Fair, the, the character Lilith in Frasier. They, that's a powerful woman to them, someone that upsets the order of nature, uh, tricks man using her sexuality the way Eve did, but it's less explicit, and, um, and gets away with it. What I admonish men is not, not necessarily to, to go you know, lifelong celibate or anything like that. It's, it's beautiful to get married and have a big family. It's, it's a lovely life, but it has to be a properly ordered marriage. What I call young men to, young strong dudes like Rocky and Rocky One, is a kind of celibacy, a weaponized celibacy until you're ready to get married. This doesn't mean it has to be lifelong. It makes men strong, like it makes boxers strong in their training to say, and to be able to say, no, I'm not going to get into that simping, right? I want to be a good man. Life with me, if, we're, if I'm dating a young woman, is going to be amazing. Uh, I'm looking for a virtuous uh, helpmate. I'm going to treat her like a queen and I'm saving myself for that. And it's going to be amazing. But before we can do that, I have to, I have to, for many reasons, many, many reasons, we don't have to talk about all of them, but I'll, if, if I start, you know, begging for premarital sex, then that turns me into among other things, a simp, you know, I want to be a whole man for you, not half a man. And then it, it, it helps man weaponize chastity, retain his headship. During courtship and then, of course, during marriage, when you don't you don't have to be chased, you set the table early that a man can be a full virtuous king when he is being chased and celibate in the courtship period. The same thing, same thing with porn and, and uh, self abuse, right? It's like, no, I'm above all that, man. So, I mean, look, I'm not trying to talk smack here, but uh, my buddy, uh, my co-author on the book I'm currently working on, which is called "Don't Go to College." Uh, we, we were talking about this and it's like, look at Glenn Beck, right? I mean, Glenn Beck says a lot of stuff that I think is actually right on. He says some stuff that's not, but you look at him and the Aristotelian idea is he might be saying stuff that's right on, but he looks like a cream puff. I mean, with all due respect, you got to look the part, you got to be the part, you got to play the part and you got, you got to be tough, strong, kingly, moral. You can't fall in all these snap, the snares and traps if you want to be a real king, 
you got to be morally, intellectually, and physically excellent. That's hylomorphism. That's Aristotelianism. It's what the West is built on, Elliot. So I love that term that you use, weaponized chastity. And again, if I understand correctly, you're saying, in essence, that men can take back their power. We can reestablish the patriarchy to some degree if we stop fornicating, basically stop having sex with girls that you're not married to. Um, I propose that idea, right? It's, it's based on sound logic. Uh, but what do I say? Or what do you say to young men who are struggling with women? Uh, they realize that the girls are going to go and have sex with, you know, Chad and Tyrone and Ray Ray and, you know, all the, all the dudes out there that are, you know, F boys. Um, and yet if they remain chaste, maybe they'll, maybe they'll lose out. Maybe if they don't follow along and do what everybody's doing, they'll be perceived as a weaker man as a result of not getting laid. How do they uh, reconcile that? How do we reconcile it in their minds that it's actually a power move to take back chastity rather than to give it away. Well, in the first place, I, I, I'm hit up all the time, the email, DMs, uh, texts, if it's my, my patrons, you know, because I have a, a big Catholic following on, on right-wing Catholic following on Patreon. And I'm trying to help young, what I call retrogrades, because my channel is called Rules for Retrogrades, um, meet each other. Because I get texted all the time by young, eligible, 19, 20, 21, 22 year old uh, retrograde girls that are like, look, I'm sick of I'm sick of um, the F boys trying to hook up with me. I'm also kind of sick of the opposite extreme on like Catholic Match or ChristianMingle.com where it's guys that are only Christian, but they're kind of nerds. They think that I owe it to them to, to wed them and be their wife they're not even dealing with the fact that I'm, I'm, you know, attraction, natural attractions, really, you've got to have both. And you got to have both together. So I know as a matter of empirical fact, young men out there, listen to me. And, and young men email me all the time, but everyone knows men want women like Jerry Seinfeld. That's what we want is women. Um, so I know they're out there looking and I know these girls are, are completely eligible. They're looking for young men. They feel they can't find young men. They want, both and they want young men that will be chased that are going to be a king for them but they not just the ned flanders kind of nerd the funny part is ned flanders in some episodes of the simpsons has like washboard abs and is strong <laughs> but but the rest of the time before he takes that green sweater off you you don't know you don't know he's not really supposed to be that way it was more like a surprise in the episode where you found out he's strong um you don't want the ned flanders ethos girls want a chad I mean, I heard it once. This is not my uh, my own attribution, so I can't say it. Girls want a bad boy who will be good for them, and guys want a good girl who will be bad for them, right? And it's not not perfectly a propo in every situation because we all want to be morally virtuous. But this is more like the primordial thing that makes us tick. That 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 is the etiology, the cause for attraction. Girls want a a, a tough guy, maybe not bad, but a tough dude. That'll right. be good for them. Guys want a good girl that'll be can can be mischievous, right? And uh, I don't have to spell it out. And so the point is, at the first level, anytime you're trying to corner any market, you're just saying, "How can I set myself apart?" So for the guys that are like, "Why be chased?" All the other f boys out there are doing X. The first thing I say is just someone giving you marketing advice is do X prime. Unless it's like something that's most basic, like wear pants, wear pants on your date, right? Wear shoes. Don't do something weird to be different. But if it's something virtuous and different, then women are fundamentally attracted to it. They're wired differently anyway. They're not as, you know, they're naturally, this is second wave feminism. They're not naturally nearly as hormonally wired anyway. So they're weirded out by these guys that are, have too much, too much testosterone that's unbounded. That's, you know, guys that seem like horny horn dogs. That's that's weird to them. They're threatened by it. So a guy that's got good control over it looks like he has plenty of testosterone. He's built well. He knows how to deal with, uh, you know, to shoe the horse, change the tire, deal with a slightly petulant waiter. This is why this comes up in all movies. The kind of guy that that's not overreacting to stuff because they know he can handle business. It's a different situation when the waiter's being a little petulant. They don't want a guy that'll knock him the F out. But if some guy goes for her, her wallet, 
he'll know how to knock them the f out. And they'll like they like to see that you can be witty and urbane and chill and dealing with the petulant waiter, but you can get down to business if a guy tries to take her wallet. They want it all, and that's the thing. Saint Paul calls us to be all you know to try if you can, like our Lord, to be all things to all men. So, and it's possible. That's that's the point. So it sets you apart, young men, when you're doing something that's virtuous, that's good, that's not weird, um, and is different. Don't be different for its own sake. But chastity is good and attractive anyway. You don't want some, you know, scaggy skank that 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 has been around the block a million times. You don't want that. There are girls out there that are good, and you want one of those. There are lots of them. They're just quieter. And I like what you say, if I could use a term to describe it as the virtuous alpha, right? Because you got the virtuous guys that are beta males, like you described, Ned Flanders. But I could totally understand why a woman would want a strong man, an alpha male. But also, it's interesting that you say that they will be attracted to his virtue, especially if it stands out in a sea of mediocrity. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, what, what what do you guys want? You want someone who's fun and cool and fit and, you know, to borrow the words of Michael Scott, looks like they run, but you want someone that's that won't stand you up on dates. That's, it's attractive to if a girl says, hey, I'll be there. You know, my car broke down, but I took a cab and then the cab broke down and so I took a trolley car. Oh, that's cool. That's someone that's like, if you agreed to meet someplace, I mean, you should pick her up on dates, by the way, but... If you agree to meet someplace, it's attractive. Someone that does something. Being a flake is unattractive. You want a girl that's loyal. You've been dating a couple months. She sees your family or your, one of your friends not treat you well. That gets mad on your behalf. Loyalty. That's one of the virtues. That's attractive. Magnanimity. It's attractive. All of the virtues attract. Right? We live in this perverted Luciferian society that tries to tell you the virtues aren't attractive. That's just nonsense. It's like filth set in a lamp doesn't attract. Uh, light does and and uh, so you just you want someone with virtues that's kind of a first principle girls want someone with virtues the reason that the left the luciferian left has been able to especially the feminists have been able to malign this and to say oh well men are men are promiscuous let's make it equal instead of making men not promiscuous and encouraging right. that let's just make women promiscuous which has been their approach um they just said, hey, virtues for nerds. And they, they've really been their own worst enemy, the feminists, because women get the most ill use now that men can get the, you know, uh, the milk for free. You know, they're not buying the cow anymore. Men and women aren't. This is the all time latest average marital age of uh, in human history in the West right now. It's like 26 to 27 and it's getting later every five years. So set yourself apart. And yeah, be a virtuous alpha. Everyone knows that's attractive. Now, the thing is, I do, I'm going to confess, I do see a lot of this, okay? And I have to tell, you know, you're, you're a Catholic, I'm a Catholic. My audience is sort of like 75% Catholic, 25% we focus on conservative politics and culture. You might be the opposite, 25, 75. What I have to tell a lot of my young dudes is, look, it's not everything to to just be like a, a wimpy virtuous guy you're not e the point is aristotle's point is you're not even fully virtuous if you're not if the body doesn't reflect what's going on in the soul that's that's hylomorphism that's aristotle that's what i talk about a great amount in the case for patriarchy a good marriage um unlike the cucked wimps on tv and sitcoms that are being henpecked and cuckolded by their wife one way or another a good marriage is comprised of, you know, I don't know, 50 or 60 years where people slip, people slide because we're all human. So sometimes man will have to say to wife, wife may say to man, it's fair both ways. Hey, you know what? I don't do the I don't do the porn because it's disgusting. I try not to I, I do my damnedest not to look at any any other uh, member of the opposite sex. We have to do each other's part in in facilitating that and so it's like you know both of us you know the easiest way is hey both of us would probably let it slide a little bit during the winter months it was too too cold the rain so maybe i need to buy a treadmill or a peloton or something and we'll both work on it we'll do it together and that that kind of conversation which has utterly been condemned by the feminists this is healthy this is what someone that loves someone 
does for them is like, hey, let's 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 get back into shape because then we'll be more attracted to each other. Rightly ordered marriage. This is a huge <laughs> principle in case for patriarchy. Should be sexy. It should be, you know, sexual. It should be cro- procreatively centered. That's why people who like their spouses tend to have lots of kids. It's a real thing, and it's it's the it's the cure for feminism. Not necessarily lifelong celibacy. Um, you know, that's for Roman Catholic priests and maybe people who are same sex attracted but want to do the right thing. You could get a wife, just get a good one, and then be good to her, and she'll be good to you. I really like this. I like this conversation. Totally counterculture and and counterintuitive to what we've been taught and how we've been living. For the past you know, 60, 70 years, it's interesting. We had a conversation on your channel the other day, and uh, what came up was the case for virginity. It just almost sounds kind of crazy to, to bring that up, but as a virtue, uh, it, I think it's something to, to, to consider. You talk about how Aristotle uh, and, these, and these virtues and how you know, you're not even really practicing it uh, unless it's, or, or maybe I'm making this up in my head and kind of like throwing this out there that there's this idea of incels today, right? Guys who are in, involuntarily celibate, right? There are lots of them out there, men who are just not getting, getting sex and they're wanting to have sex. And so as a result, they're quote unquote, they're virgins, but not necessarily virtuous. And if I understand correctly, that, that, that the fact that you're in celibate doesn't necessarily make you virtuous unless you're doing it intentionally. And this case for the intentional celibate or the intentional uh, virgin just doesn't even seem to be, um, I mean, it's almost laughable in our world today. But yet may be the, the very thing that uh, restores the patriarchy. Yeah, Aristotle calls uh, that kind of pseudo virtue, he calls those the similitudes. So like, you can't, bravery is always ordered at the good, fortitude, it's one of the virtues, right? And the way Aristotle wires this all up is he, um, he says all the virtues are a golden mean. So courage is not an extreme with cowardice on the other end. It is a golden mean, a geometric mean, meaning not exactly in the middle, it might be closer to one end or the other. It's a geometric mean between uh, a vice of deficiency a total lack of whatever the stuff of courage is. Obviously, that's cowardice. But on the other side, uh, the vice of excess. So the vice of of courage of excess would be what he calls rashness. Uh, and courage is probably a little bit closer to rashness than it is to cowardice. In this case, it's closer to the uh, vice of uh, defic- uh, excess than deficiency. But you get the point. Like, um, courage is the right amount at the right time between excess and deficiency. It's the right amount of that stuff. So all of the different, and those are all the virtues, all the virtues function on the system. Aristotle's philosophy is beautiful because it's a systematic philosophy. So uh, I don't know. Amicability is the right amount of friendliness between what he calls obsequiousness. You're too nice to everyone. And I I forget what, what he calls uh, the vice. He doesn't even have names for all the vices, the vice of deficiency. I forget it's in between them. For Aristotle, for the the Roman Catholic uh, worldview, virtue is a golden mean. Now, all of the virtues are an angle on the good. Uh, So, you know, a situation angle, a situational angle on the good. In other words, how do you be good in a situation of danger? Well, courage. How do you be good in a situation of um, having power? Well, it's magnanimity. How are you good in a situation, uh, a time of peace? It's amicability. So they're all just, where do you find yourself? That angle, that angle, that angle on the good. So the similitudes are fake virtues that look otherwise like courage. But if you're you're calling it courage to do something like hop a fence and steal, um, you know, a flag from a flagpole or something at a memorial, it does take something like courage but it's not oriented at your good, at your ultimate end. So Aristotle calls it a similitude. And that's what I would say about the men that are out there being incels that are, I, you know, I knew guys like this in middle school and high school. Super, you know, randy all the time and talking dirty, talking gross, uh, gross thoughts, probably addicted to porn like nobody's business. But there are virgins that that ain't virtuous. That's a similitude. They would lose those lame wads would lose 
their virginity if they could, right? They're not oriented at the good. So that is at most a similitude. Let me just tell you, uh, uh, Elliot, Aristotle has it all figured out. And that's why the Dominicans in, at the beginning of the second Christian millennium, namely Thomas Aquinas, brought his writings into the faith because he figured out so much of this stuff, Aristotle. That's why he's the man. Dante Alighieri calls him the master of those who know. I do give courses on timothyjgordon.com on this stuff. I'm giving one on the Constitution in between now and the, the summer release of the holding of the most important Supreme Court case ever. Uh, so people can learn the Constitution over the next five months. I'm also, I also give an Aristotle lecture that's available for recording. Learning Aristotle is like the central thing that must comprise the education of young people, middle-aged people, old people alike. And our society ignores Aristotle, the, the blessed pagan. Sometimes even in the Catholic tradition, he's given a green halo because he figured all of this stuff out. And it's the key to eudaimonia, having a happy life, a moral life, a good life. In a moment, I'd really like to move on to the Christian requirement of the household patriarchy, what the household patriarchy is and what it looks like. But before moving on, there are two things that you've said uh, that I think are really important for my audience to hear. Number one, uh, and yeah, I'll throw them both out there. and We can kind of chew on it. Uh, a properly ordered marriage furnishes the most beautiful life a man could possibly have. Uh, let's stop there for a moment and tell me a little bit more w- about what you mean there. And how could that be so in a world where so many people are avoiding marriage? Well, I mean, I would say this um, time magazine and several law reviews republish this every year, uh, an article that's now viral called the paradox of declining female happiness. And simply citing the fact that everyone's been brainwashed by this feminist psyop, second wave feminist psyop that really began with the first wave 100 years before anyone knew what feminism was. Citing that everyone thinks it, all you're citing to me, because I'm a debater, right? All you're citing to me, my friend, is that everyone's brainwashed. But the empirical data is out there. The women who were were conned into the workforce, we, we should talk about Simone de Beauvoir and Betty Friedan, an important conversation. They had two feminists, an old one and a young one. Um, they're conned or forced into the workforce. And the, li- the left, the cultural left, admits every year by republishing this article, the, the paradox of declining female happiness. Everyone go look it up. That they thought once women were ripped out of their natural forum, the, the home place, and either shamed or legislatively forced into the workforce, they would become happier. And every year they get a little less happy. They're the most unhappy demographic in society, suburban women who have been conned into uh, the workforce. So I I, I forget what the call of the question was, but um, I, I would just point people to a very interesting dialogue between this old French feminist, Simone de Beauvoir, kind of in between first and second wave, and young, famous uh, Betty Friedan, American feminist, second wave feminist. Beauvoir told Friedan, look, um, in France, we understand something you Americans don't understand because you guys are so obsessed with your personal liberties. The feminist movement will never be successful unless we make it illegal for women to stay home because that's, women's nat- that's what they're created to do. She, was, she didn't know it. She was citing Aristotle. Uh, the function argument. Women want to be there because it's what they're created to do. Keep the home beautiful, right? Procreate, cook, clean, uh, cheer the home, garden, keep a journal, read, pray. This is what women were created to do. Be protected. They all love it. They're all attracted to it. It's what they all want. So uh, Beauvoir tells Friedan, you Americans, you won't like this, but you have to force them because if they're left with the choice of working or staying home, they're all going to stay home or most of them will. And Betty Friedan's like, well, I think the American way is to use shame. And that, that way, by the way, turned out to be pretty effective. Most women have been shamed into the workforce and they feel embarrassed that they want to stay home and keep a home and, and be a, a handmaiden and make it beautiful, beautify, garden, cook, clean, knit, bake, uh, you know, pray, take a nap during the day. I mean, that stuff is all beautiful and fun. Uh, you know, most men wish they could join. So the point is the rightly ordered household 
is simply ordered around the head of the home, which is the father, following the Aristotelian wisdom, the function argument, doing what a human man was meant to do. Leadership, all men were built to lead. You don't have to be the, the cork master of your wine club. A lot of guys have this blocked wish. They're not leading at home, so they're seeking it elsewhere. We call that a blocked wish. It's like you don't need to be at home. You should enjoy being at home. You should be honored as the leader there if you're doing the burdens. The benefits will come there with. So be at home. It's enjoyable to be at home, have a big family. Everyone looks up to the paterfamilias. The wife looks at you lovingly. You're everybody's hero. Like uh, Renee Zellweger says in Cinderella Man, you're the champion of my heart. That's what a father should be. I ain't bragging. I'm just saying this is what I am around here. My wife and kids hate when I go run an errand. They want to come with me. We have a good time together. Play with them, pray with them, lead them. Men are built for leadership and women are built for followership. Uh, the Christian teaching is men are the active principle. Women are the passive principle. Men are the expressive principle. Women are the receptive principle. That's why Adam and Eve are, were such a uh, perversion, a convolution of nature, right? Who was expressing herself to the serpent? The woman. It's supposed to be the man mm. doing the kind of dialogue. Women want to be protected such that a well-ordered home is just the, the, the heart of the home, the woman, the heart, you know, the heart follows the head, uh, acts like the heart. And the head of the home, the male, acts like the male. The children will be happier. Everything functions beautifully when the man acts like the man and the woman acts like the woman. It's the function argument. It go, again, it comes down to Aristotle. So it's, it's pretty evident that women have taken their new role, as you would say, uh, or you could say uh, the new feminist role as a byproduct of shame. You're talking about they're shamed into it. Uh, I would throw pride into there also, this sense that I'm strong and independent. Uh, a lot of men, which of course, is turning women away from marriage, turning them away from family uh, and setting us up in a situation now where we have, you know, declining birth rates and, you know, people are shacking up, not getting married. But the law seems to be stacked against men. So if shame is what's perverting women's perspective on marriage and life. I would venture to say that beyond promiscuity and pornography, the law seems to be set against men with regard to marriage. And I see a lot of guys who are avoiding marriage, even though maybe they're with a woman and they're having children simply because the divorce laws and the courts are stacked up such that it seems to be a losing proposition for many of them. I'm a, I'm a champion for marriage. I've seen it work well in my home because my parents are married. They stay married. I married, my brother's married, and, and it's all working out really well for us. Maybe we're blessed, maybe we're lucky. Um, but what do you say to the men out there who may otherwise consider marriage, but they're just afraid that the laws are going to, you know, or, what they, or they're going to have what they call divorce rape, that they're going to get married and because the divorce is so easy and because usually it's the man that ends up paying and getting less of the, uh, the benefits um, what, what good reason would they want to get involved? Well, divorce, no doubt, is a catastrophe. And the divorce rates, if we consider first-time divorcees, aren't quite 50-50. It's more like 40-60. Um, that, that's total divorcees, and divorcees tend to get uh, re-divorced in their multiple marriages. So it's more like 40% first-time divorce rate. That's the first thing to say. Ha it comes down to another Aristotelian teaching, habit. I wasn't planning on talking about Aristotle so much today, but he's, he's so key to everything. Habit, right? So, so people that come into a marriage with the improper frame of reference tend to get lots of divorces. That's because they are doing everything wrong. The nice part about getting married, a, a man who has the proper frame of reference, even though none of us are perfect, to a woman who has the proper frame of reference for what marriage is, she's not perfect either, is that you can be, you can strive towards perfection together, especially sacramentally, right? That's, that's a different thing for, for you and I because we're Catholics. But um, even just on natural grounds, if a man approaches marriage and says, look, I, divorce is catastrophe. It shreds your life apart. It's expensive. Uh, the children are, get thrown into the mix. You have to argue over this stupid 
uh, wagon wheel coffee table you didn't want in the first place to, to borrow a line from Billy Crystal and when Harry met Sally. Um, it's at all costs to be avoided. And six, the, the, I guess the good news is 60% of people are avoiding this, getting a first-time divorce. The bad news, Elliot, is that of those 60%, and I'm talking traditional Catholic, I go to the Latin mass, right? Traditional Catholic, regular Catholic, Protestant, secular conservatives that tend to want to stay married, that actually think marriage is noble institution of the West, the most noble institution of the West, I would say, because family is the cell of society. Um, even those of those 60% who stay married, I visit a lot of people, a lot of trads that seem very much like, oh, if anyone's going to do this right, they would. Even in those 60%, I'd say 98% of them are operating on the subtler delusion of the confusion of men and women's roles that I talked about in, in the opening half hour. And therefore, even though they're going to stay together, it's not necessarily an attractive and exemplary marriage. Um, it's not necessarily a model marriage. They're just, you know, they're, they're, they're overall like nothing. We're not going to do divorce. And they might take some of the measures to avoid it. And their wife thinks that too, particularly the more serious they are about their Christianity. We're not going to do that. We're just not going to do that. But they live with these needless um, inefficiencies, externalities, as economists call it, needless squabbling. And one of the things I'm probably most proud of in my life, you know, I'm not, not proud of my degrees. I'm writing a book called Don't Go to College right now for Regnery. <laughs> so it's not the degrees. It's not, you know, my accomplishments when I played basketball. It's not any of that. It's, it's, my marriage, because um, part of my apostolate, part of my leadership, the Protestants would call it ministry to young people, young men and young women, is they see, because my wife comes on my show with me sometimes, rules for retrogrades, and they see, wow, this is the real deal. Like a properly ordered marriage is beautiful. You don't have to be celibate. I mean, I'm a Roman Catholic. Again, the priest probably a more beautiful overall lifestyle but more challenged there because they have to be celibate so I, I don't know quite how to characterize the lay we're the lower patriarchy they're the higher one there's more honor in 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 being a holy celibate but for regular people that don't want that i always knew i liked the ladies i wanted to pick the best is that it's very this stuff feminist because i know look i mean think about it i wrote a book called the case for patriarchy I came out with something called the case for patriarchy challenge. I say, go read this someplace public like uh, Starbucks and read it like this young women, young men, and they do it. And they send me pictures reading this and they get stopped and ask questions. They call me all sorts of stuff. Oh, it's probably heavy handed. You rule like a tyrant, anything, but our household is just, I mean, not, we're not perfect. There, there are fights occasionally, but they're occasional because my wife is my best friend. We knew each other since we were teenagers, uh, kind of like you and your wife, Elliot. Um, she thinks I'm uh, I'm the champion of her heart. I think she's the the best girl I ever met. I did date a lot, so I happen to know empirically. There's no one that was close to her for a fit. We're we're big fans of each other's. That means it spills over to our kids. We like our kids. We hang out with our kids a lot. St. Teresa of Lisieux has the most beautiful parents, and like all of the kids are these amazing nuns or holy people. That's really good commentary on the parent is how do the kids turn out? And their model was essentially, look, look, you got to do what you got to do during your day. And, you know, you can't skip it or it becomes bad habit, vice, sin even, but get it done. This includes prayer. You got to pray together as a family. You got to do, you know, pick up the dog, do you got to men have to work somehow, earn the daily bread. Women have to keep the house smelling nice and looking nice. But after that play with play, have fun with each other as much as you can watch movies, play board games, play video games. I hear all this shit talking on video games among conservatives and traditionals. I'm like, well, if you're doing it not by yourself, but with your kids, it's really fun. Um, well, over Christmas break, we've been playing video games for hours a day, you know, go outside, run around, tackle them, pray with them and play with them and make your wife, your best friend. And she should be your Lieutenant you know, taking orders, but that doesn't mean you're giving orders all the time. What does a good general do? He's not barking at everyone. He's, you know, in, in peacetime, not wartime, when you need orders occasionally, you just, you're just relating to them as someone that has their common good in mind. It's a lovely 
lovely way of life. And I'm just, it's the thing I'm most proud of in my life is my marriage and, you know, the way my household runs. It's really fun. <laughs> I have to agree with you. And it sounds like you and I have very similar uh, lives at home with our wives and our children. And uh, I'm sure there are many that are listening to us right now. They're saying, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds like something that I'd like. Um, could you tell me for a moment, what are some of, because you mentioned it briefly, but what are some of the mischaracterizations of patriarchy, right? And I know you mentioned, you know, ruling with a heavy hand. What are some of the other myths, I guess, have been, that have been per perpetrated over the past you know, several decades about what patriarchy means? Yeah, I just want to say before I answer, Elliot, yeah, that's the first thing I, I told Steph, my wife, who kind of helps me and does everything. A lot of times she's behind the camera. And um, so she's like, oh, that was a cool interview. When you came on uh, Rules for Retrogrades, that was a good, that was a lot of fun. And she's like, seems like, seems like he likes his wife a lot. seems like his wife would like him a lot. It just seems, seems similar to our kind of household philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. So we noted the same thing. Uh, so the primary mischaracterizations are these. They're really perverse, yet they're really, they're really obviously wrong. That's what I mean by perverse. Yet they're really popular. Yeah. And, and both you and I have talked about how it's fun to dispel obviously wrong, yet popular misconceptions. Uh, um, Aristotle, <laughs> going back to the master, he talks about, look, there are three good types of regime for a state. And they also, uh, they don't really hold for a house, but, but they can be analogized here. There's a monarchy. It can be a good regime. This is the rule by one. There's also a rule by few that also works when it's well done, a called aristocracy, rule by few. And then and it can also be good. And also good is the third type, a uh, polity or a republic, the rule by the many. They have to be well ordered. And any of these three, rule by one, rule by few, rule by many, all work well. Uh, all of them, when they become disordered, they change into a perverted form of government so different, so disparate that, that they take on different names. So a monarchy, when the rule by one, when the king is not ruling for the common good of his subjects, he becomes a tyrant, right? Or a despot. And it's a, a fundamentally different form of government. It's when he perverts subsidiarity. It's when he takes too much power and he doesn't care about his subjects. When an aristocracy, same thing, rule by few for the common good, neglects the common good, it becomes ruled by the few for themselves. And that aristocracy becomes something called an oligarchy. And it's bad. It's just the few on top, like what you see in socialist governments, like, you know, the Soviet Union. Um, and same thing with a republic or a polity. So rule by many when it's well ordered for the common good, it's good. When it becomes ruled by many in a relativistic tyranny of the majority way, it becomes called something you will recognize, a democracy. The, the, the sole reason I bring this up is to answer your question technically. It's the idea that when we're talking about a household patriarchy, we're talking about a monarchy, uh, aristocracy and, and, um, and uh, you know, polity don't work for a household. But the funny thing is when I wrote this book and when I go and I do interviews on it, people will always go, well, isn't rule by one fundamentally a tyranny? And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the freak. That's the freak cousin. That's the disordered version, right? When you order a plate of food of, of lasagna at an Italian restaurant, are you expecting to get the freak rotten you know that might happen one out of a hundred thousand orders you get some you get they serve you some freakish thing you go to a really low quality restaurant or they just didn't know that the food they're serving you is about why would i expect that right that's the disordered version of a plate of lasagna is one that's got cockroaches on it or something or rotten <laughs> spaghetti sauce but you ought not to be expecting the disordered version. The ordered version is what you expect. I mean, in a restaurant, it's because you ordered the ordered version. So when we're talking about a uh, you know household patriarchy, we are talking about a kind of limited monarchy. Really, it's unlimited, according to St. Paul. But you're talking about a monarchy. So you ought to be expecting, and this is why virtue matters so much, Elliot. It's the wife is counting on you rather helplessly the kids are counting on you completely helplessly to be a good man 
not just to nerd Ned Flanders and not beat them. Yeah, that too. But also be strong enough to protect them if some guy goes after your wife's purse or worse. Uh, also, not just strong and protective because this life is fleeting. We get about 80 years to go around protecting their afterlife, which lasts forever. So you got to be smart enough to be you know, spiritually and, and intellectually bright enough to be a leader. So that's why assuming that a man wants to be good, and most of these young guys that contact me, and I think you, they care enough to ask. We just have to teach them. Look, the grand psyop guys in society has been to get off the Aristo Thomist, means Aristotle and St. Thomas program, which built Western civilization, which assumes that the common good yeah, the common person is, 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 you know, not they're not all Aristotle's. They're not all, you know, Diogenes. They're not all Socrates. They're not all a bunch of geniuses out there. Average IQ is like 98. But people are fundamentally put together, designed, created to want to be happy. And happiness involves being moral. So it is possible. And you want a happy household as well. So being good is ultimately kind of ordered towards your own happiness, as well as your wife and your kids. And that's why people are interested in it. People that have gotten hooked on drugs, they know like, oh, I was making fun of the nerds in high school when I got, when I started down the drug path with the gateway drug. But really, those nerd kids are a lot happier than me. Now I'm stuck on, you know, smack. I'm hooked on meth, whatever. You go down the dark path a little bit and you see, well, the well-ordered path is the one that I want to be on. And this is the one that creates the happiness for men, women, and children. I can imagine that a lot of the guys listening to this are nodding their head in agreement with you. And I would venture to say that maybe it's easy to nod your head when the call to action is for leadership, your leadership, male leadership. But what does a man do in a world where that's such a foreign idea when he's looking for a woman that's going to fit into that sort of a, uh, a, a home, a, a household patriarchy? What kind of well, two questions. What would be best for him to look for in a woman? And then once in the relationship, what is the responsibility or what are the responsibilities of a woman, a wife within a household patriarchy? I'm not trying to do a shameless plug here, but there, there's a lot to know. What, what you should first look for is uh, someone that attracts you, right? So this is not uh, the religious go-to answer a lot of times people will say oh well, find someone at mass find someone at the mass you go to find someone that you know that that's important but that comes actually a little later you have to find someone in a non-sleazy area it could be mass could be just a university or a high school classroom also people should be looking for their mates in late high school by the way the way you did um that, that so just find what attracts you because there is this you know, we're talking about Aristotle, the body and the, the soul together. Uh, they're not extricable. Marriage is a long time. So you have to be, you're going to go through goods and bads. I've been married a little less than 20 years. I know you've, you've been married a couple of years longer than me, Elliot. Um, you want someone that you're really attracted to because it's a sweet incentive program, you know, physically and their personality. You need both. So first find someone you're attracted to, but you don't want to meet at a meat market. That's going to be gross, right? That's going to be someone you don't, you wouldn't look at, um, if you want a thoroughbred dog, you're not going to look down at the, at the pound, right? You know, the, the pound <laughs> is for someone that's got a lot of love to give and can de-louse and de-flee and probably neuter or spay, do all the things they, they're going to need to do. If you want an elite show dog, you don't look at the pound. So it doesn't have to be necessarily church, but people need to know what they're attracted to. At the very least, it should be a university classroom. And then you should start asking questions. Mm -hmm. I do cover a lot of this in the case for patriarchy. And it's like, look, so you should start leading immediately, but you don't want to be annoying. And so the problem is a lot of guys need almost something like leadership training, which is why I think you're, you're, you're talking about really focusing on patriarchy and um, some, some specific videos are really important that you could do, or there, there's some videos I've done on my channel. Who knows? Maybe we could team up. Um, Guys have to know how to lead and not be annoying. I, I've come across some guys that I've advised that then I hear from the young lady later and it's like, whoa, this is just coming off as creepy. You got to be 
really charismatic and really attractive. So the girl's interested and you're like, oh, no, I don't I don't do that. Yeah, sorry. I don't I don't know. Uh, you know, one time a girl I was going out with told me, oh, I'm on my period. So we don't have to worry about that now, at least till next day. And I was like, oh, no, I don't, I don't do that, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that just that just made her 10 times more attracted to me um, that I was like, no, no, sorry, I don't tangle with that. I didn't even, I just left it there. I didn't even say it was a religious thing because I wasn't really practicing Catholic and undergrad. It was just like, no, you get power by being a dude that says something like we talked about a half hour ago. Like, look, I, I'm, I'm off of the um, I'm off of the I don't do the premarital. So for one thing, you get a lot of power just from this feminist psyop, just by telling them, you don't have to say it right up front either. That can look kind of dorky or like you're trying too hard, but just when it comes up, you know, be, be gentlemanly and you don't even have to bring it up like a Christian thing. Just be like, yeah, no, I'm off that. Uh, don't do that. And um, really what I'm looking for is a high quality person. I want to be a king. I look, I don't, I just want to be the best I can be morally, physically, intellectually, and um, you know, there's maybe stuff more for a second or a third date. On the first date, you just want to be cool, even in, even in secular terms. Just cool without – borrow as much from the secular world as you can without violating your principle. So look good, look athletic. The secular world likes that. Then maybe a second or a third date, a young man starts saying almost more like this neo-stoicism that's really, I think, good, taking root with podcasts like – uh, Martyr Maid or Jocko Willink, guys like that, they're getting interested. And it's the path back to Christianity for Western yeah. civilization. The neo-Stoic thing, just like, no, I don't do that because it's it's not virtuous. Arista, it's kind of kind of almost Aristotelian. Aristotle's different from the Stoics, but it's similar. And just be like, I don't do that. Look, I just want to, I'm just focusing on whoever I marry, you know, this might be a third date. Whoever I marry, I just want the best person that's interested in raising the most amazing kids. And being an amazing person and for as a woman, being being a, a, just a great lieutenant, great right hand woman, uh, great handmaiden. And I just want to be the most kingly dude out there, like fit, tough, so virtuous, no compromises with immorality, um, fun, just have a good time and just just have the best household we can. This is our vocation. This is our path to heaven. Um and it also makes a good life for us here. So you start dropping that stuff, maybe in more neo-stoic terms, uh, a second or third date. First date, just be cool, reel them in. And then you can get more specific, you know, the general before the specific. Then after that, you're like, look, you know, and yeah, there, there is a kind of supernatural reason why I'm so, my wool is so steeled. It is because I'm a Roman Catholic or whatever, or I'm a Christian. You can get to that on fourth, fifth date. But at first, just start peppering in I, look, I, I'm going to be an amazing leader. The woman I select is going to be an amazing handmaiden. And, and I just want to make an amazing life by by leading from the front, not from the back. Women really like it a lot. Yeah, I love everything that you're saying right there. It's very wise. You also make a point uh, or a case in a way for courting over dating in the book. I kind of been using that language lately with the guys in my program, but it, it, sometimes it's hard to describe. What do you mean by courting as opposed to dating? What's the difference there? Yeah, some, <laughs> it's, it's funny because some traditional like Catholics will, will take it really far. I think too far. And they're like, that you should have, I mean, some of it kind of makes me blush because it gets Flandersy. You should never be alone until like you're married tonight. That's just ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You have to, you have to exercise. That is literally the accidental, what, what Aristotle would call the continent exercise of chastity. It's, it's a fake chastity because you're, you're basically saying your willpower couldn't be alone with this girl because all of a sudden you're going to start fornicating or something. So courting is more, I don't mean it in the full sense that some, some people are taking it really to an extreme that I, that I don't admonish. You should be able to go alone. Go on a more classic date, dinner and a movie date or a dinner and, you know, go, go someplace you can really chat, date, dinner, then coffee, you know, just have a good time, L laugh, try to be making each other laugh for heaven's sakes. Um, there's a lot to laugh at in this world now and it's fun to, to do. And a lot of times, particularly when you get older, idle times with a man and wife, you just need to be able to laugh even when you're bored at a DMV appointment together or something waiting to be called. It's a big thing. So you want someone you can laugh with. 
courtship just centers around the way I use the term. It's probably close to the way you use it, Elliot. It's just focus on getting to know each other. The, the attracts, the physical attraction should be there. It should be broiling. It should be hot. You, you want to be really attracted to this person. And again, sometimes there's underemphasis on that with Christians. They're just like, ah, I want to have a lot of kids and I want to take them to church. And all. it's like, that's all you need that. But you need to be really attracted to the person because unexpected challenges are going to be on your life's path. So you want to be really attracted to each other. You want to be chased and you want to be like, yeah, we definitely go on dates, go to different settings, especially settings where the young women can see the man thrive that don't appear to be too contrived, you know? Um, let's, let, let them see you do you, age quad agis, as we say in the Latin. Um, but it, so when I say courting, I just mean focus on, you know, a chaste, a chaste relationship, uh, a more old fashioned, doesn't have to be, uh, you, you will get laughed at if you're like, well, I brought my grandma to watch us. I mean, it's stupid. It's ridiculous, right? But but treat it like your grandma's there. And um, again, you don't have to be a, a wimp or a nerd. Just just be like, hey, you look, we're gonna we're gonna be safe. And of course, the more you date, and the more it becomes like a, a girlfriend boyfriend relationship, you will see each other not just in public settings. You'll be at each other's home. But the 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 emphasis on chastity early, and and not a long period of courtship, by the way. Uh, you know, you, so people that want to not engage in fornication, premarital sex, you, one of the main thing, I would kick myself if we got all the way through this interview and I didn't say this, the period of courting uh, your, your wife for four years is ridiculous. You know, when I was, I used to be a Catholic school theology department chairman. I've also taught college. Um, the thing, but I, I taught in a, pol a politically conservative area in California. Parents would get the most pissed, not when I went through anti-abortion stuff or anti homosexual marriage stuff or when i taught hardcore about islam you know the christian teaching the, the non-ecumenical teaching they're all political conservatives so they never got pissed at me the one thing they would get really mad at me was when i was like look if you guys go off and you meet a really good girl or you ladies go off and meet a really good guy your freshman year of college really good like a commodity a market commodity chaste attractive cool sweet everything you wanted be ready to scoop them up, this is particularly for the young men. You can't expect to court someone for four years. That disorders the relationship in a lot of cases. So you got to be ready to get, get married young. And then a lot of the parents are like, well, I don't want to pay tuition. It's like, well, does this add to the tuition cost? It actually probably subtracts from it if you're in married student housing. The boomers have been another psyop part of the feminism has been particularly the boomer generation telling Young people, right wing people say go get work experience, left wing people say go get life experience, you know, go backpack in Europe and have a bunch of spread your wild oats. It's all the same thing. They're saying don't get married young. And that's a big mistake because once things move along and you're you're not so much a, a, a young chicken anymore, a spring chicken, it's it's much harder to find what you're looking for. And um, and and also to, to bring it back to the call of the question. It's much more difficult to uh, be chased, you know, if you're like, I'm looking down the barrel of four years. I just met this girl. She's great. The beginning of college. I don't want to be celibate all four years. Right. That's a fair thing. That's, again, Aristotelian. You're like, yeah, let's be celibate for six months and then get married. We, we, we could do that. We can't date for eight years unless I'm, you know, Thomas Aquinas, who's like superhumanly virtuous. His family tried to bring him to prostitutes and he said no like <laughs> most men will fold over the course of dating a girl for six years or something don't do that six months you can make it you should be looking 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 for the highest quality market commodity young men young women and then get married fast get married young it's beautiful what do you say to people who are like uh i'm not sure if i should marry this person until i have sex with them because what if it what if it's no good uh, in the bedroom. I mean, this is an argument that a lot of people make. Yeah, this is a secular lefty argument. I, I mean, if it's no good in the bedroom, then um, I don't know. Or, 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 or have we, have you consulted a physician, you know, is, is one of you uh, 
missing parts or do you not really like you? look when both of you have private parts kids kids out there listening when both you have private parts and you're crazy about each other like your personality right the, right the pervert the pervy left is always saying this the best sex organ is the brain when you like someone you love someone you're really into them you know when you're your girl's hero and she's your your, your best handmaiden your only handmaiden um it's just it's gonna be really great i mean you're gonna blow each other's minds i i, I mean maybe consult a physician does has one of you been mutilated down there it's just right. something the left started saying the feminist yeah. left and it's like how can you not have a good time right That's particularly if you got all that bottled up yeah i i i I'd never, I've never not had a good time. And um, <laughs> yeah, I probably went far, far, far too, too close to uh, uh, going all the way with, with many young women. But even when I was kind of out of, out of the Catholic church, not practicing, I always knew not to go all the way home for a homer. So I've only been with my wife and it's, it's always been amazing. <laughs> I, that's all I can say. So this is a little bit of a different question. You've got five daughters. I've got three. I mean, having daughters is a challenge just to begin with. What are your thoughts on people who send their daughters to college? There, this is an interesting question um, because I'm writing this book, Don't Go to College, with Dr. Mm -hmm. Michael Robillard, who you might have heard of. Tough guy. He's philosophy PhD. He's got a, he's a, a army ranger, West Point grad. He's a tough dude. Um, but we're like, look, and both of us have like all these degrees between us. And we're like, this is, this is stupid. College is a, a psyop. So we're saying that kind of to everyone, not to a hundred percent of everyone, but to 95% of everyone. Yeah. It turns out the university built by the Catholic church um, is really for the speculative sciences, philosophy, theology, you know, the handmaiden of theology is philosophy, mathematics, pure mathematics. It's not really what the wasps in America and England turned it into like a glorified trade school. Uh, we should let trade school be trade school. We should let the university go back to being for future sacerdotal order, the you know, future professors. Not everyone's a college boy. Not everyone's a college girl. Now, the thing is, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm all for getting women back into the home place where they're happy, healthy. Um, you know, everyone gets home. I can't imagine on this new world order, this model of um, college is not to become really smart in some speculative science, which is disordered. It's for glorified trade school and all girls should go there. All girls are being molded to go to college. All guys are being molded to go to this trade school college. I can't imagine, uh, and I, I, I don't have to because many of my friends lead this existence, the lives of the, the unisex, the, the two income trap, where you're getting home at 5.30, 6 p.m., you know, your wife's getting home at 5.30, 6 p.m., everyone's tired, everyone's grouchy. Um, Jose Maria Scriva writes about this beautifully. You're, you're gonna, if you're working, you're going to be kind of grouchy when you get home. The house isn't a home. It's cold. It's not seasonally decorated. It's not cleaned. No one's been cleaning by the day. You're picking up the kids from daycare or school late, one or both of you. Um, you have to argue over who makes dinner. You have to argue over who cleans it up. There's no time for anything. Everyone's got to go to bed early. I'm not really an early to bed cat, you know, because the, the hellish workaday routine begins early for everyone. Everyone's just out of the home the whole time. Whereas we, and I do have a sixth little girl on the way, um, <laughs> we homeschool and we kind of go to bed late. Because um, also when you're homeschooling your kids, you realize it really only takes two to two to three hours some days one and a half yeah. to get through the lessons for the day when you're teaching just two or three or four kids. Um, so everyone can kind of get up at their leisure, it's nine, nine AM, eight 45, get up. And my wife starts homeschooling the kids at nine. There's no schlepping them around in a minivan. Everything's quicker. It's a home economy. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a home economy. It's like, everyone's not, we're not having to go to bed at nine or eight 30, like all these people. Cause they have such a hellish routine. They could wait, sleep in two hours later. Everyone's in a better mood. Everyone's happy. The house is warm. My wife has been putting on Christmas carols, you know, in the background as she's uh, teaching the kids. And then they're done by lunch and they can rest and play and watch a little TV. And, you know, they're getting a better education because we're teaching, you know, I teach them some little Latin and stuff, which I'm also a Latin teacher. You can go to my Latin classes online at timothyjgordon.com starting in 
January. But it's just, it's much, much, much better. So the man gets home at five to a, a home. It's warm. The smells cooking. Uh, you know, it's clean. It's seasonally decorated. Maybe the wife and the kids did some gardening or did some, a lot of times my kids would have some projects that they made in homeschool. Um, everyone's waiting in a good mood. Only one guy's kind of in a little bit of a grumpy mood, the single wage earner. And everyone cheers him up. And then he's re- he's out of that mode. He's ready to be home and to get a kiss from his wife and go shoot shoot uh, shoot free throws in the front yard with his sons and and look at what his daughters have been up to. It's really lovely, and it saves a lot of money. You don't need two cars. This nonsense about two cars in every garage. You don't need it if you're homeschooling. And so the only thing I would say uh, to to the caller your question that I've kind of talked around, Elliot, is college for young women is not inherently bad as long as they go to a non-Marxist institution. Um, Most even Catholic universities now are Marxist. All 22 Jesuit schools got taken over. There is a list called the Cardinal Newman Guide to these less heard of faithful Catholic schools that'll teach philosophy, theology, that could be useful for homeschooling for uh, a wife or a husband, you know, a future wife or a future husband, men or women. So I'm not against women going to school the big state schools which tend to be glorified trade school sorority fraternity the drugs the sex culture the 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 worthless degree anyway that i'm against but if a young christian wants to go to one of the 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 finer protestant uh universities that actually teach the faith or one of the minority catholic schools i want to teach the faith or a secular conservative place like hillsdale or claremont more power to them The problem is you don't want all that debt and not everyone's a college boy or a college girl in the first place. But the main emphasis needs to be on go to college or don't go to college, depending on how good you are at school, boy or girl. But you should be setting up for a one income household, young people, if you can. Or if you take all these cultural cues, hate feminism, hate feminism, hate feminism, but then you get trapped in the two income trap then feminism gets the last laugh and it gets yeah. to sort of back um, back into all of those things. Because once you have two jobs, how do you decide whose career is more important? One, what if your wife has to move? No one's taking care of the kids. You need two cars. Homeschool is not an option. No one's cooking. No one's cleaning. Cleaning and cooking become a fight. The feminism gets backed in, even if you agree with all the cultural stuff I'm talking about. But then you're on two incomes. It, it, it's really savvy and people don't think you can live on just one income. You can, you just have to make some cuts. And I don't mean you can't have a television. That's not what I mean. I mean, you don't really need two cars if you can uh, get off your job and do whatever uh, with, with the family. We just go grocery shopping with the family. We do have two cars, but my wife just likes to go with me. We kind of do everything together. <laughs> so that would be my answer. Sounds yes, a lot like young, mine. young women can go get an education, but doesn't yeah that's what we picked up when you were on my program man we just go together right i mean we have two cars but we usually only use one is because like why not go together because she's not at work and i've got some free time it's pretty cool when you like your wife and uh you could do those things yeah it is it's like fun i mean i i don't hang out at grocery stores for fun but you get done doing what you do now i work at home but i do this interview with you and then i i'm writing this fourth book of mine and so i'll do an hour or two of that and then you're ready for any kind of diversion the term means like anything that might not have been fun before now becomes fun and because i like my wife and i like my kids going and shopping at the store is fun so we're never in the car without each other pretty much i am sometimes well my wife doesn't need a car and so we have a second car we never use it now, the battery died two months ago because I didn't use it for so long at a time. I'm not, I'm practicing what I preach. We, I forgot to drive the second car because it's like this two cars in every household is fundamentally feminist. You don't need it. Everyone's happier when they're in the home. When your wife and you drive uh, or going somewhere, do you always drive or does your wife drive sometimes? I, I always drive. It's just because she doesn't like it. She, we've been in Mississippi for almost almost a year and a half. She doesn't even have her license. I think we were just laughing the other day. I was like, you should drive like once here. Have you driven these? Because they're very different roads. You know, back we're driving through the forest, which we love. We're both Californians. 
Yeah. We hated that. And I'm like, you haven't even driven these back forest roads. They're, they're kind of fun. But she's like, ah, oh, I, I don't really like it. My wife doesn't like driving. I try to get her to, but she doesn't have her license after 18 months. Yeah. Just a, just a funny question based on the fact that my mom. How about drives. you? Does your, does your... I grew up with my dad, basically. If they're ever in the car together, my dad always drives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it might seem arbitrary and some people laugh at me, but I'm like, I, I have a very hard time sitting in the passenger seat with my wife. I'm like, I'm the man. I'm supposed to be behind this steering wheel. And she loves that anyway. She doesn't want me to. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's arbitrary at all. I mean, because it, <laughs> it is a hand-eye coordination. Have you ever seen hand- I have a lot of this in here, Elliot. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not arbitrary. Hand-eye coordination of, of men versus women on average is not like a little higher, right? I mean, people have to understand. I, I'm just defending Women don't like it. The women that are driving, when the men are in the car next to them, it looks effeminate for a reason. Yeah. Hand-eye coordination of men and women is not even yeah. comparable. Did you guys know there are eight times more male geniuses in the world than females? We're built differently. Have you ever heard of Karsten Brash, the uh, 2000 era male tennis player? He's ranked like 200th in the world. Venus and Serena thought that they could beat him because he was 200 ranked. He played both of them after smoking a cig, drinking a beer. He wasn't warmed up. They were. He played them back to back and he creamed them both. Nearly zero. They each scored a point or two on him, but he creamed them. He'd had a cigarette and a beer and both. I think it was Serena later. was like, I've never, never had a ball come back at me like that. We're different creatures. We're not different species, obviously, but we're almost like different species. We're so different. So the feminists just, if anyone out there is watching this is like, oh, yeah, every time we say some of this stuff, like, oh, are they going to go there? Women shouldn't even drive. It's like, I don't know. I, it's not even should. See, you're talking about it like a feminist at that point. Half the time I'm laughing. I try to get my wife to do it. My wife has never driven our RV. We've had an RV for about two years. I'm like, I just like to see you drive this big rig. It's 30 feet. And it's funny. It would be funny to see her do it. And I'm literally trying to get, I'm like in a parking lot. She's like, no, I'm going to crash it. So <laughs> It's, it's not this heavy handed thing. It's right. just for people like you or me that realize how different men and women are, which is why they're attractive, by the way, because right. of their, their alterity, their otherness, their difference. I, I, I like my dude friends. I like you, right? I'm not attracted to dudes. That's, there's something disordered when you're attracted to what's like you. You're, right. you're attracted biologically to what's different. So they're just so different that it, it makes me laugh when my wife tries to come out and shoot free throws with me and my son or, or when she drives a car. She doesn't want to. It's just we're totally different. You have to understand people like uh, Morpheus in The Matrix. You think that the socialists are bad? Well, they are. You think the communists are bad? You think the globalists, the, the health globalists over the last two years of COVID are bad? They are. And, and you think that you've been red-pilled because you talk about these things, how, how deeply subtle the, the traps of the socialists and the globalists and the healthcare goons are. Yeah, they are. You've been somewhat red-pilled. You haven't been red-pilled until you understand, boys and girls out there listening, how very different men and women are and how beautiful our relationship is when we realize how different we are. That's the ultimate red pill. Yeah, and it's also the the end the other end of the most um subversive uh trick lie that we've we've taken on right because it's almost like it flies under the radar it has been flying under the radar for so long it's in our music it's in the movies it's in the media it's on tv it's in the schools basically everybody thinks or sees through these blue pilled lenses and uh and like you're saying you could be you could be operating at a woke level or a red pill level in various different aspects but if you take a look at your home if you take a look at the household patriarch and how that's held up you can see right away that there's um there's a fundamental lacking there i i like jordan peterson i like i like some of the things he says i'm not a big fan um but i've heard him say some really cool things but i just can't help but to not to knock him in any way but to see how he kind of lives and behaves and perceives in a lot of ways from a blue pill perspective it doesn't make him less of a important man to the men's movement but at the same time if you look at you know the way he's operating from a fundamental level it's like wow dude you kind of swallowed the the pink pill in many regards 
hey, so I don't want to hold you Agreed. much longer. Agreed. I, I, I like. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, please do. Sorry, Ellie. I didn't. Yeah, we have a little delay here. I was just going to say I like him too. No, no. Oh, you know, all love on him. All good things. God bless him. I know he had some challenges over the last couple of years, but I agree with you, a hundred point zero percent. Mostly a force for the good that he's saying common sense things, but with all due respect. That usually means something disrespectful is following and court <laughs> judges will tell lawyers that I, I don't mean it disrespectfully, but it's very, 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 very hard approaching impossible for boomers for a baby boomer to get all the way red pilled. It yeah. just is particularly on the sex stuff. So sometimes they'll say something good about men for men's movements, but then there'll be a presupposition buried in there. It's like, ah, that's blue. That's a total blue pill, man. <laughs> So I'm with what you said, but he's been good on the whole. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah, I bring that up just to show how pervasive it is. It's, it's there underlying many of our assumptions, uh, no matter how, how good or how much we're trying to avoid it. Um, so I, I just want to wrap up with this. Um, by the way, everybody can find your book on Amazon. That's where I found it. I was doing some research on patriarchy. It showed up right away. And I, before even knowing that you were the author of it, when it went ahead and purchased it because it was right up my alley. You also got a bunch of other books, the rules for retrogrades. I love that one. Your website, you mentioned a bunch of times. I want to make sure that people know how to reach you. You said it's timothyjgordon.com. Yes, sir. Timothyjgordon.com. And we're, we're starting up a new um, slew of online classes in late January. So you have some time. I teach uh, beginner Latin, which is just a really cool language, whether you're Catholic or not. Um, you'll learn so much about grammar and about our language from learning beginner Latin. Um, beginning also a, an intro to the Constitution course we're starting up. I think we're going to do a really fun Tolkien course. You can buy old recordings of the Aristotle's ethics course, which has everything that I've been talking about. It's like wow. a 15 or 16 week course. That's just recording. The other ones are live so people can interact with me and ask me questions that are beginning in January. Um, that's on timothyjgordon.com. It's called, it's under the Retrograde Academy tab. And I, I've really appreciated being able to come on here. Also follow me on Twitter, if you can. I'm Timotheology with two E's, Timotheology, one word. Tim, if I could ask you just one last question to sort of uh, put, the, put the nail in this. Uh, you talk a lot about virtue. You're an, you're an Aristotle student. Um, we're talking about patriarchy. You have a whole chapter on the virtues that are required of a man, patriarchal virtues, you call them. Would you be willing to maybe pull out your favorite one or maybe the most important of virtues that a man must cultivate in order to uh, live the patriarchal lifestyle, to, to, to be a strong patriarch himself and to build a rightly ordered home, as we've been describing here in this call? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Well, so remember, the lineage of what we call the Athenian Enlightenment is Socrates was teacher to Plato, Plato there, spinning the ball on his finger. Uh, Aristotle was the student of Plato. So it's kind of grandparent, father, grandson. Mm -hmm. And um, so Plato and Aristotle agreed on a lot on the virtues. Plato thought there was something called a unity of the virtues. You'd learn all this if, if, uh, if you guys are out there, you take, take the class on timothyjgordon.com. Um, Plato thought you could get one virtue. I always liken it to the muscle groups that would get all the other ones for you, like one, one ring to rule them all, one ring to, to bring them all. Um, Aristotle's like, no, they're not. Um, they're, they're not. They couldn't all be predicated under, you know, different categories that the good, uh, which is what all of the virtues aim at, would not be ensnared, would not be captured by all the different virtues if, if there is one that could get them all. His, his explanation is a little technical. So he differed with Plato on whether there is one mega virtue that would get all the other virtues. Um, there are times when Aristotle's describing the um, four of the cardinal virtue, we call them the four cardinal virtues, right? Uh, uh, justice, temperance, fortitude, prudence, right? We, we call it, uh, the way to memorize it is, uh, uh, pe what, what is it? Peanut butter. Well, I forgot the way to memorize it. Uh, it's something, <laughs> prudence, justice, peanut butter jelly. Uh, so the peanut butter jelly, the four uh, cardinal virtues, 
Aristotle toys with calling two of them the ruler's virtue. So even though he says there's not one that'll get the other ones for you, you got to work out your courage muscle different than you work out your magnanimity muscle, right? Uh, you got to work out your amicability in a different sense than you work out your magnificence. But um, the cardinal virtues are more close to the bone, uh, prudence, justice, temperance, uh, fortitude. And I would say that justice is the most male, the most patriarchal of all the virtues because justice means giving to each their due. It's why uh, a virtuous man, it, it, it spills into more of the other virtues, even though there's not one that gets them all. So uh, a virtuous man will remove his emotions from a situation in a way that's basically impossible for a woman. Uh, so like, well, I know that guy did me wrong, but here I'm, I'm still going to pay him this. Or I know, know that, you know, my kids are being really irritating now, but I also can sort of back calculate that I, I had an extra bad day at work. So I'm not going to over punish my children. Um, you know, women, I, if I ever get pulled over in the car and it's a, a woman officer, I know it's because St. Thomas Aquinas talks about that justice is the male ruler's virtue. If she's having a bad day, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm out of luck. If, uh, if I do anything to even inadvertently threaten her authority, she's going to feel so threatened. She has to prove herself, come over the top. Justice is the first thing to suffer. Justice is not a strong, uh, naturally wired virtue for women, which is why it's called the ruler's virtue. Men must be rulers. Whereas men can separate more. A virtuous man will and say, um, you know, I'm not going to do that. St. John Chrysostom says women are quicker to anger, which is why they can't lead. And they'll take it out on the subjects. Even a good woman is quicker to anger than a good man. We're not just talking about bad women, bad men. Men are more wired to their justice. That's what makes justice blind is like, well, you were a jerk to me, but I owe you this. You're a jerk to me, but you are really, really good at basketball. So I'm still, I'm not going to take that away from you. Women tend to be more Oh, you were a jerk to me. So even though you're good at basketball, I'm going to say you're bad at basketball. And it's just, it's, it's the difference between our natures. Men are designed to be just and justice spills into more of the other virtues than any other virtue. That's amazing, man. I love that answer. Justice being a just man allows you to be a great patriarch. Well, I really appreciate you taking your time out to join me here today, Tim. And uh, I think you're doing awesome work. And I would love for everybody to come check you out, man. So until next time, I'll talk to you. Thanks a million. Great talking to you, Elliot. All right, Tim.